to another week of the Behavior, Evolution, and Culture Seminar Series. I uh, feel like I just saw some of you since we had a special talk on Friday. Um, but we have uh, today's talk and then actually two talks next week. Um, so I'm going to tell you just about the one on Monday and then the next one at on Monday. So we've got a jam-packed schedule for the, towards the end of the quarter here. Um, so the full schedule and the schedule for spring should be up soon um, on the website, bec.ucla.edu. Next week we have Ivy Pike coming from the University of Arizona Department of Anthropology, and her talk is entitled Embodying Violence and the, Bi Bi and the Biocultural Approach, What Can Nomadic Herders from Northern Kenya Teach Us About Linking Contacts to Global Health Disparities? So be sure to be here for that. And this week I am pleased to... What day is the second talk? Um, I was hoping you weren't going to ask me that. Oh, I sorry. think it's sorry. March 8th. No, that no, March 8th is a regular. Tuesday, March 8th. March 8th. Tuesday. Yeah. Or no, I'm sorry, the special talk is on March 9th. March 9th. So it's on Wednesday. 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 Yeah, okay. but, I, but I will confirm that. It's on the website, definitely, and we'll talk more about it next back. Okay, so we are pleased to have uh, Sarah Mesnick here today. Um, she works at the Southwest History Science Center and is affiliated with UC San Diego, right? <coughs> and is going to be talking to us today about sperm whales, social structure, behavior, evolution, culture, and conservation. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to Brooke and Leo for coordinating and to Susan Perry for extending the invitation. It's an honor to be invited to speak with you, and I'm really happy to join in a conversation about behavior, evolution, and culture. What I decided to do today was to give you three vignettes, um, things that I've been thinking of that illustrate different aspects of behavior, evolution, and culture, and are somewhat questions in my mind that are unresolved. So I'm exposing myself to you and your insights from your fields about what you see when you look at these examples. All of the examples uh, today are going to be drawn from sperm whales. So I wanted to give you some depth as well as some breadth in uh, looking at these questions of culture in marine mammals. Um, I'm happy though to take questions about different species and in the afternoon session I have a couple other uh, systems that I wanted to talk about. So one is uh, tuna and dolphin uh, uh, interaction and another with elephant seals. So we can uh, broaden as we go on. So please uh, feel free to ask questions. I don't know how you typically do that, but I'm fine if you want to interrupt for clarification or general questions. So sperm whales derive their name from the spermaceti organ, which is uh, found here in the head. This is a large lipid-filled chamber, and that uh, uh, lipid is used for in sound production. So essentially, this animal, a third of its body, is devoted to sound production. They are extreme in many ways. These are largest of the toothed whales, so they're related to dolphins and porpoises. Male, they're extremely sexually dimorphic. Males are up to 60 feet long. Females are about half of that size. And they're global in distribution. They're found from ice pack to ice pack. Um, killer whales are the only species that have a larger, uh, only marine mammal species with a larger distribution. Uh, they eat um, primarily deep sea fishes and squids. Uh, you can see the squid in the mouth of this female here. And because of that deep diving, or that um, foraging behavior, they're deep divers. So they typically dive from 20 to 40 minutes. But some individuals dive, or um, adult males can dive for well over an hour. And because of this deep diving uh, behavior, we also see the formation of social structures that involve babysitting and other intense um, social aspects, including um, what looks like helping behavior often because of the need to be foraging at depth but to have your young at the surface. We know um, actually a pretty good amount about sperm whale social organization because of the work of um, some earlier uh, folks, Beth and Osui, who worked um, in whaling. Uh, sperm whales were heavily whaled because of the that spermaceti organ. They were the subject of two global 
a massive waves of commercial whaling. And from that, there was a lot of information to be gained from the animals killed. And biologists uh, worked with the whalers and learned quite a bit about the social organization and life history of whales. More recently, um, primarily from Paul Whitehead and his uh, students, uh, long-term photo ID studies have enabled us to study the natural or the uh, wild behavior of sperm whales. And then more recently, the advent of molecular tools, and I'll tell you some more about that in a moment. Um, what we know about uh, sperm whale organization uh, is that they're organized in a hierarchical structure. That adult females and their young um, are thought to reside in long-term social units of about 13 individuals. And they occur in the lower latitudes, tropical and uh, temperate waters. The inner birth interval is about four to six years. So a female will have one half every four to six years. And there's temporary associations of these units to form mixed matrilineal groups of about 20 to 40 individuals. So when you're at sea and you encounter a group of sperm whales, what you would typically see, we would define as a group here. And it's only through the long-term photo ID studies that you would know that that group is actually a temporary association of maybe two to three of the units. And then sometimes, if conditions are, are right, say there's good forage in the area, you get aggregations, large aggregations of uh, hundreds to thousands of individuals. And it's thought that males disperse from these uh, their natal groups um, sometime between 3 and 15 years of age. Once they disperse, uh, males are thought to form these loose, they're called bachelor schools. And those, uh, as they mature, males slowly move higher into higher latitudes, so that adult males are solitary and they're found on high latitude feeding grounds. Um, come the breeding season, at a schedule that is still unknown, uh, males will come back down from these high latitudes and roam around groups of females looking for females that might might be an estrus. And if there's uh, highly possible that a male comes into a group, and if the females are reproductively synchronous, a male may uh, mate with a uh, number of females in a group at a time. So because uh, much of the data that I'm going to talk about, um, or here are the, what I'd like to do today is talk about three um, aspects of uh, illustrating different aspects of behavior, evolution, and culture. And because I work for the National Marine Fisheries Service, this is all under the rubric of conservation and how do we use this knowledge to manage and conserve sperm whales. So the first example I'm going to talk about is what is the social structure. And by this, I mean the genetic relatedness of individuals within groups. We'll go to, um, I'll look at the traditional view, which were stable natural lineal groups. Sperm whales were thought to be like elephants. And the emerging view that we're finding is that there are uh, mixes of kids and kids. And I'm going to give you um, an interesting example of something we saw a few years ago <coughs> off the shore here to talk about what the implications of these mixed groups are when you look at healthy. <coughs> then we're going to scale up, and I'm going to talk about um, population structure. I'll focus in the North Pacific and comparing the genetic results that we get with what we know about vocal uh, uh, traditions. And look at this comparison between acoustic or cultural structure and genetic structure. And then the last example is um, something, uh, I think an interesting uh, example and is a big management issue is depredation, which are sperm whales that have learned to take fish off of long lines and that behavior is spreading. So we'll talk about social transmission. Um, the, because uh, each of these is going to touch on some genetics, I wanted to give you just a little bit of background. And how many of you are have done genetics or familiar with genetic techniques and tools? So, it's, so I'll go through this kind of quick. But part of it is interesting of how you get samples. <laughs> Um, so tissue samples uh, are obtained primarily from direct um, biopsy 
which you see here in a small boat. There's a crossbow with an arrow, a boat, a arrow about this big, and it's got a tip that you can see there, and that tip is stoppered, and it goes into the animal just about half an inch or so and pulls out a plug of skin. And from that skin, we can do all sorts of genetic work, but also stable isotope work and contaminant work, hormone work. We know more about some of these animals than I probably know about myself. <laughs> the other thing that we can do is pick up slough skin, and that's what you see in the net there. So whales like you slough skin, and that whale dandruff we can go and pick up on, on the surface of the water. <coughs> so about half of our samples are obtained in each of these ways, as well as um, some samples that are obtained when animals get caught in fishing nets and are, die, and there's a sample taken from that, or they strand on beaches, and you can take samples that way. Um, we use uh, three uh, four different types of markers. Um, the first is sequence variation in the mitochondrial uh, DNA, which gives us the maternal inheritance. Most of what I'll be talking about today is based on the 400 base pairs of the hypervariable region one of the control region. Um, but we are working uh, currently on a mitogenomics project, and I hope um, if you're interested in the talk, we'll come back and show you the results from that later on. But most of these will be just based on this 400 base pairs. Um, we use uh, two different nuclear markers, um, uh, microsatellite, hypervariable microsatellite, and um, more recently, a suite of single nucleotide polymorphisms. And We'll be looking at those alone and together, depending on the analyses. And then, um, even though these are large animals, it is sometimes difficult to know what sex they are. And so we use, if we can't figure it out by looking, uh, we use uh, sex determination work. Um, I wanted to go just a little bit more uh, detail on <coughs> the unusual mitochondrial diversity in sperm whales because it is a conundrum of which we are still looking, and it's quite interesting. Um, what you see here are the results of sequences of a 1,000 animals from around the world by the Cochalote Consortium, which is a group of small researchers. And there's 24 variable sites. Um, the location of that 400 base pairs is shown at the top. And these 24 variable sites define 28 haplotypes globally, and they're listed uh, here from A to double B. So there's only 28 haplotypes um, so far. I think there may be a few new ones um, by some researchers up at the University of Oregon. But there's very little variation. As you can see, also, the um, comparing it to uh, the top sequence there, the, a similar base pair is shown by a dot, and a change, mutation, would be shown by a single base pair. And there's very little uh, variation among these. What's also striking is not only are there few haplotypes and little variation all transitions between them, but globally, about 85% are one of three haplotypes. So this is pretty interesting. You can pick up a sperm in Tasmania and one in Iceland, and they have the same haplotype. And obviously, this is why we're sequencing the whole minor genome. Uh, and we actually don't see much more variation doing that. So it's a very interesting uh, pattern. And there's been a number of hypotheses in the <coughs> literature about why this may be. Uh, was it a bottleneck? Is it um, stochastic heterogeneity, cultural hitchhiking, groups of life history units? or some adaptation to deep diving, because it is the mitochondria, and they do have extreme uh, metabolic function to be able to do that. And this is not resolved, so it'd be interesting to contrast this to human variation in the mitochondria. Okay, with that background, um, I'd like to uh, move into this first uh, vignette, which is a uh, social structure, genetic relatedness within groups. And we asked some simple questions of groups comprised of a single natural line. <coughs> are they like elephants or not? And how are the group members related within those groups? And for this particular study, we had um, for groups, remember, which can be these amalgams, or probably are amalgams of um, long-term units. We had 40 that were sampled at sea, 40 different groups. 
And the number of individuals sampled ranged from 2 to 15, and the group size ranged from 3 to 180. So we have sampled not very well. They're partially sampled, about 1% up to about 67% of a group we have samples from. And then we had three mass strandings. There's an instance of this. Um, and of those strandings, every individual was sampled. There was a group of 11, 37, and 64. This happened in Tasmania a few years back. Um, I say they're completely sampled. We don't know if there were other animals that were in the water, but every animal on the beach was sampled. And there was no observations of animals in the water, but um, if you had this as an alternative, you would probably get far away. <laughs> but it looks like all the individuals that um, <coughs> died were sampled. And then we have two examples of units where we know that they were long-term associates. Um, a group in the Galapagos that um, Hal Whitehead and his grad student um, sent us. And this one uh, was based on a recent pub pub publication um, by Hal Whitehead's um, student in Dominica. So we have about 43 groups and two of these units. And this shows the number of mitochondrial haplotypes that we found in those groups and the units. And so looking at the groups, we see that um, there was one haplotype found in about in 17, and two to five haplotypes found in 23. And remember, there's only 28 haplotypes in the whole world, so one group could have almost 20% you know, of the genetic diversity. Um, the stranded groups, one group had one haplotype, the other had um, two, and the other had four. And then in the um, units, we see um, two haplotypes in this Galapagos group, and Galapagos unit, and only one in Dominica. And as far as I know, this one in Dominica is probably the best evidence that there is of a um, more of a pure matrilineal. This was the group of seven. And it looks like why there might be some individuals missing, it, could, it might not be many to do that. And one of the things that's interesting about Dominica is this is um, an area in the uh, Caribbean where there's not a history of whaling. So one of the questions here with the mixed haplotypes is what is that reflecting? Is that the natural um, behavior of sperm whales to live in mixed matrimonies? Or how much of that could be a remnant of whaling, of us um, killing the individuals that would have created the pure matrimony? Does anyone know when uh, whaling, the animals that we get right off the coast here, when whaling ended in California? So, hard question for a group of anthropologists. But the last whaling station in California, in the U.S., was in San Francisco, and it closed in 1972. So these animals live human lifespans, and they've been subject to whaling just off the coast here, and certainly um, other places in the world. Okay, so how are group members related? Um, here, um, we're using the microsatellite markers, and we are using, in this analysis, um, the measure of color and good light, which asks simply the probability that a single microsatellite looks like probability we would find it in two individuals. And individuals that are first order, the unrelated individuals should, um, the probability distribution would be around zero. The first order relatives, mothers and offspring should share 50%. Um, full sibs would be a distribution around 0.5. Um, similarly, second order relatives would expect a distribution around 0.25. And of course, these distributions depend on your markers, as well as they don't prove a relationship. They just say the pattern of a similarity is what you would expect. Um, this is a cluster diagram, one of uh, many that, you could be, that could be constructed. From the stranding in Stanley, Tasmania, there were 10 individuals here, one of which was pregnant. And often when animals strand, they abort their fetus. So we have a mother and a fetus here. And you see the um, ID of the sperm whale, and then on the far side, the age, which is gotten from the growth layer groups of the teeth. And what I've done here is code first order relations in yellow, 
individuals with um, no close relations, meaning as um, as if they were sampled from a population that large in grain, and ones that are kind of fall around the second order um, level in white here. And you'll I'll keep this uh, color scheme up for the next couple slides. And what I wanted to point out was a few things. Um, first, the parent offspring relationship um, indeed has this. Uh, higher degree of relatedness and they cluster, the individuals cluster together. Uh, and we have very, otherwise we have very little ground truthing to do this kind of work. Um, the second thing is this, to point out, is this animal that seems to have no close relations in the group was um, fairly old and she's lactating. Um, this um, older, the 61-year-old individual looks like she could have been the grandmother um, of some of the others in that top cluster. And the clusters themselves have no close uh, ties between them. And so what it looks like here is we have clusters of closely related individuals um, uh, associated together, associated so much together that they actually strand and die on the beach. So there's some very close bonds going on here even though it looks like some of the individuals have no close genetic relations. Um, here's the Galapagos unit. Um, this is the one that Hal um, and his students have followed over, a, uh, I think it was a 10 year period. There were five females in this group, and they're shown here from the bottom. And there's one male that was seen with this group a couple of times, and they had samples, so I put them in the mix. And as you can see, um, none of these females seem to be closely related to any of the others. And there were two different um, haplotypes present here. So this was Hal's best um, group at the time for a closely, uh, what thought would be a matrilineal group. Uh, the next two uh, images I'm going to show you are the larger strandings. This was 37 individuals um, that stranded, and the next one uh, was, I think it was uh, 65. And you see the same pattern, so I won't uh, belabor this point, but you see clusters of closely related individuals, the yellow, some individuals with no close relations. And in this case, there were two other things to point out. We had some individuals, these two males that are right here, that had a, um, fairly high degree of relatedness, but they had different um, mitochondrial haplotypes, so it looks like it could be an instance where they're related through their fathers, not their mothers. And also in here, we had nine juvenile males, and that was very unusual um, for a couple reasons. Um, they were older than the age at which you would expect them to have left the group, and they had different haplotypes than the females in the group, so their mothers were not here. So it wasn't that males were sticking around a long time and not leaving. It seemed like some other males had come in that were definitely not related to these females. And again, the bonds were so strong that they ended up on the beach together, <coughs> um, stranded. So that, there were some interesting patterns with the males. And this is the group of 65. And here, um, the color coding on the far right are the two different haplotypes. And we were curious if in the mix, these bigger groups of different haplotypes, if the maternal lineages would cluster together, and they didn't seem to. So um, from this, it seems that both groups and units of females and their dependent young contain clusters of closely related individuals, um, but some show no close relation. And the emerging view from this is this is kith and kin. There's some uh, kin selection that would be operating here, but the, the bigger thing keeping this together seems to be other uh, include other types of bonding. Um, this picture is um, something I, I thought you might be interested in, as it happened right off the coast here a couple of years ago. And this is a group of sperm whales, and they're being attacked by a group of killer whales. And when this would be um, an interesting behavior if you saw nothing else but this group together and you thought that they were all kin. 
and they're all hanging out at the surface. They had their heads in and their tails out. They were in this rosette formation. And it would be easier to explain that the animals were staying together if you thought they were all genetic relatives. But it's probable that these animals were not. And this kind of behavior then becomes more difficult to understand. And I thought that this group um, has thought about altruism and the evolution of these kind of behaviors um, more than I. And so I thought I'll tell you a little bit more about this, and I hope it's something that we can uh, talk about. Um, what we have here is um, the animals together, their heads are in. And you can see um, the killer whale here. And this is uh, that animal's baby, or, or it's a young from that group. And we came on this um, activity in the morning. It was dawn. The captain of the boat um, got on the loudspeaker. We were having breakfast. And she said, I have a group of sperm whales up here being attacked by killer whales. Anyone want to come up and take a look? <laughs> and we thought she was kidding. But sure enough, we came up, and there was just a small slick on the water of oil, which is what happens when blubber uh, rises to the surface. And there was a group of about nine sperm whales and a group of about 15 killer whales um, surrounding this group. And what happened over the next few hours were these uh, waves of attack. And you can see the killer whales coming in. And they came in in small groups. Uh, like sharks, it was just the females and their young, uh, would come in, swim over to the sperm whales, uh, dive down, take a bite out of the sperm whales, shake around, and then let a uh, fountain of blood come out. And they would just then hang back, let the animals bleed, and then every uh, you know 20 minutes or so would come in and do this again. And one of the things that was startling that we saw was part of the killer whale's technique here was to take a sperm whale and pull it out of this rosette. And then they would attack it. And on one occasion, we watched a couple sperm whales leave the rosette, swim over, and come pull the animal back into the group, of course, exposing themselves along the way to the killer whale. And the first time we saw that, we were like, are we sure that we saw that? Did, you know, did, did you just see that? And it happened over and over during the attack. So what was very interesting here is sperm whales, as I mentioned, can dive deep. They have big tails. They're bigger than the killer whales. But their response was this rosette formation and not to leave. And if someone was, or an individual was pulled out of the group to bring that individual back in. And after about uh, three and a half hours, some of the individuals had very big wounds like this. And uh, at about four hours later, um, the big male that had just been hanging out on the outskirts of the killer whale came in, rushed in, took a bite of the worst injured animal, and shook it and drowned it. And they, um, the killer whales fed on, those animals, on that animal. And the others just floated um, away. We followed the killer whale, actually. But there were at least a couple others with um, serious wounds. So in the end, there were about 20 killer whales there and these injured sperm whales. And it made us really think about, it changed my mind at that time. I had always thought up until then, if any animal was immune in the ocean from killer whale attacks, it would be sperm whales. They're highly social. They travel in groups. They're not called Moby Dick for nothing. They're known to be aggressive. And it showed that killer whales really probably have a major effect on structuring the, the social lives of individuals who cannot be alone out there. And there is no place to hide. The only place to hide is in your group. So gave me a, quite an appreciation for the power of sociality in the ocean. Can't they dive? It was a very good, we were dying. <laughs> like, so it was very interesting. The only thing being that um, they're both acoustic predators. So if the sperm whales dove, the killer whales could hear them. And, and at some point, you'd have to surface. So if you dove and surfaced alone, would you be more at risk? Why didn't they also use their tails? I mean, they're bigger than the, the uh, killer whales. Um, so we were muddling over this um, for quite some time. 
And, and about five days later, we took this photo. And what happened here is we were watching a group of sperm whales. We're still right off the coast here, kind of off the coast of San Luis Obispo. And we saw some sperm whales, and they were um, doing a lot of aerial activity. And two small clusters all of a sudden came together and were doing all this aerial activity. And then we noticed there were killer whales in the distance. So it looked like they were um, reacting to the killer whales. And then we're on a big ship with large binoculars. And we can see to the horizon where groups of sperm whales were coming in, in a straight line, pushing white water. These are not animals that usually move that fast. They were coming in with calves, females with calves, adult males, coming in. And in the end, about an hour later, there were two lines of sperm whales facing out and the killer whales uh, finally decided to go somewhere else. So these changed my thought about uh, life in the open ocean where there is no place to hide, that the bonds individuals form through, a, so when you're living out there, uh, raising young, needing to die, but having your young at the surface, contending with predators, that the bonds formed through association, through lactation, are certainly as strong as what we typically think of when we think of kin bonds. So I'd be curious talking to you about this, of what other, um, uh, what this reminds you of, and what you call those kinds of behavior. Like, is it altruism or not? And since then, we've seen in other species some uh, very other, other very interesting, uh, healthy responses from whales. And some of those have been uh, published recently by my colleagues Bob Pittman and John Durbin. We can talk about those if you're interested or if anyone's seen them. Okay, I'd like to move on to the second example here. And this is one where I'd like to scale up and talk about um, population structure. And uh, this is work that you can understand thinking of uh, two different um, questions that we ask in at a management organization. Um, and the Endangered Species Act asks us questions uh, because of the heavy harvest of sperm whales, do we have evidence that sperm whales are recovering now that they've been protected? So we need, in order to ask if they're recovering, we need to know what the population structure is. And then under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, we need to uh, mitigate contemporary threats to sperm whales, or to any marine mammal, such as um, cap, uh, incidental take in fishing nets, uh, depredation, ocean noise, climate impacts, things like that. And so our job was to determine the stock boundaries for the currently designated stocks in the North, Central and North Pacific, and to um, understand the population identity of males up in Alaska. And I'm going to show you the results of the population structure work rather quickly, but then I want to get to a question of culture. And this is where um, we have samples. Um, it took about 20 years to get this number of samples when you work on sperm wells. 300 samples from about 128 groups or sampling events. Um, as you can see, spread from Peru up to the Pearl Islands in Alaska. And the um, animals up in this area of Alaska here, just remember, are all, and um, throughout the Aleutians, are all adult males, either singles or following um, fishing vessels. And then down here, we have mostly females and dependent young, but there are some subadult males and some adult males in that area as well. And there's a number of ways you can divide up this ocean. Um, when you think about how do sperm whales divide up the, their world, um, one of the ways, and this is just um, a representation of the strata based on the stocks that are um, designated by the National Fisheries Service. So we have a Hawaii stock, a California, Oregon, Washington stock, and an Alaska stock. So these are political boundaries. But they are based on some other um, data on oceanography there. So we've extended this to be a California current stock and um, rec um, movement records as well. 
And then this Eastern Tropical Pacific stock is based on how Whitehead's work showing, and our work showing uh, movements between individuals in that area. And to make a relatively long story quite short, um, here's the results from the mitochondrial and the combined nuclear markers. And you can see the California current when we compare it to the Hawaii um, stock and the Eastern Tropical Pacific stock. And in yellow are significant differences. And that Hawaii, California current stock looks like it is isolated or genetically distinct from the uh, whales to the west and to the south. And we could not distinguish the whales in Hawaii from the eastern tropical Pacific. We have a mix. The mitochondrial DNA shows that there could be differences, but the nuclear um, DNA doesn't. So it looks like we should manage this California stratum as its own stock and that we need some more samples or some more markers to determine um, whether animals are moving across that more um, southern area between Hawaii and the Eastern Tropical Pacific. And there's a lot of things we need to do with these data accounting for social structure and things. But uh, when we do that, we get about the same results. Um, for the males, um, I'll also do this fairly quickly. What um, we were asking here are, is there a single or a mixed population of males up in Alaska? And what we found is that basically we have no evidence that those males in Alaska come from any of the, any single of the lower latitude stocks. It looks like they're mixed, that there are males coming from all these low latitude stocks. They're feeding up in Hawaii, and then they're returning at least some to the stock from which they were um, born. And so we need to manage these Alaska males as a mixed stock on a foraging ground. So the reason I wanted to give you this um, background is that determining that initial step of determining the strata is, is, is difficult. How, how do we think these animals divide up the ocean, and then how can we then test it? And you can think of all sorts of ways of doing it on oceanographic currents, on movement patterns from tagging and tracking, on prey, what they eat, on historical distributions from whaling. But the other one is to ask about cultural. Uh, how do the whales culturally break up that ocean or structure that ocean? And I'm going to give you a quick background on the sounds that sperm whales make. I mentioned that that whole head is has evolved to as a sound producing organ, uh, is essentially their nose. Their uh, nose is uh, particularly large for a being able to direct, make loud and direct sounds. And they're used for two main types of activities. The first is echolocation. So this is when the whales are um, traveling or looking for prey. And I'll play these for you. This is the um, even paced clicks that you hear while whales are foraging. Sounds just very uh, regular, and you can tell the size of the whale by the distance between those clicks. And if they find prey, it sounds like this. And so they can hone in on prey and detect what it is. Uh, but they also use the same type of sounds for social communication. Males make these clangs. They're slow placed, loud clicks on the green ground. And they are really loud. You can hear them about 20 kilometers away. So that's you making a sound and somebody in, you know, uh, 20 kilometers from here being able to hear it. They're really loud. Sounds somewhat like this. So they're much slower, much louder. And then females and their and their dependent young the groups make sounds um, that are called codas, and they're syncopated. And Hal Whitehead and his lab have looked at um, these sounds uh, in the Southeast Pacific and around the world as well. 
And then the Southeast Pacific has identified three different coda types, so different patterns of syn um, syncopation, and you can see them on the right there. And so one of the questions we had was, <coughs> what does this tell us about the way sperm whales are structuring their oceans? And the vocal clans, this is his house work from the South Pacific. Um, he had samples, both genetic and acoustic, from this large area. And based on his movement patterns, he can divide this area up into three geographic regions. And if you look in one of the geographic regions, like the Galapagos, you can see the color coding indicating the different types of codas that are there. So the codas are syntactic. You can stay in one place and different um, groups come by and they are, um, you're, they're exhibiting the different coda types. So we were curious, what gives a better um, signal, genetic signal, the geography or the codas? So we asked the question, are the geographic areas um, genetically distinct? And so we, this is just a straight population structure. Divide up the three areas. This shows the haplotypes. You can see the haplotype A being fairly common in all three areas. The three areas are there in the group sizes and the haplotypic frequencies. And there is a number of different types of tests you can do, Mantel tests, partial Mantel tests traditional amoebas and nested amoebas. And what you see here is the overall test, only one is significant, two are not statistically significantly <coughs> different. And two of the three pairwise comparisons are significantly different, but not all of them. So there's some support for this geographic separ separation, which makes sense of the areas. Um, this is the same data divided up by clan. So you, again, you see the three clans at the top um, and the haplotype frequencies. And just take a look there at the A's. You can see quite a difference. And when you do the same type of um, statistics, all three give you a significant overall difference. And all three of the pairwise um, differences are statistically different. So our vocal clans, in this case, and this is preliminary data for a number of reasons. We don't have nuclear data here. We've done a lot of controlling for unequal group sizes, things like that. But it at least uh, raises the question, are vocal clans a case for the conservation and management of culturally significant units rather than demographically or geographically significant units? And if this is the case, it makes it really difficult for managers because how do you manage um, this kind of structure? Okay, and the last example um, I wanted to talk about is depredation. And this is a 60-foot male sperm whale up in Alaska. This is a demersal longline boat, and that boat is 60 feet long as well. So this is a big issue and a growing issue for uh, the fishing community. Uh, depredation is uh, defined as the taking of catch um, by wildlife from humans. And you can see it in fishing, but it's also well known of taking um, like lions or wolves, taking livestock or elephants um, in <coughs> Africa, um, crop raiding. So this is in no way just restricted to uh, fishing. Um, sperm whale depredation, um, we did a review a few years ago, so this is a little bit outdated, is now known in these three ocean basins in which the targeted prey is different, but it's all fish, and it's all done by demersal long lining. So the type of fishing is the same, the prey is different, and in all of these places, white sperm whales take a lot of squid, they probably, those are nat probably were natural prey in these areas. And in southeast Alaska, we've been partnering with Jan Straley, who runs the program. And uh, this is an image from her. And I just wanted you to get for a moment an idea about the scope of the amount of fishing that is going on. Uh, this is a, a long line boat and shows the number of hooks on one line. And a boat will typically set three lines when it's out fishing. 
And if you do a back of the envelope calculation, there are a lot of hooks up every year in Alaska for sablefish and halibut. And that provides a lot of opportunity. Um, the rates of depredation are um, calculated for that area, and these are estimates that when whales are, are whales are present at about 16% of the sets, but when they're present, depredation is found in about 65%. The whales, however, are not taking very much, just maybe 3% of the catch. Um, but for some of these fishermen, that is the uh, margin of profit. And in other areas, like the Southern Ocean, they're taking much more. And killer whales are taking, you can strip a long line and take 100%. There's a lot of management implications. We don't know the ecological impact of this. Are these fish that thermals would be taking anyway? So how do you do, how do you um, allocate the catch limits? And also there's a big potential, obviously, for injury and mortality, and fishing, um, can, fishers, cannot catch endangered species in nets without having implications for the fishery. So this is a big area for potential conflict. Uh, essentially what fishing does, it makes it a lot easier for swimmers to catch prey. This is a um, uh, acoustic track. Um, across the x-axis is time, the y-axis shows depth. And there's one whale present here Looks like it's feeding, you can hear by it making those homing sounds, and it's foraging about 250 meters. Um, here's what happens when a, a boat is present. This whale then is just able to hang just below the surface and take the fish as it's coming off the long line. So it's made it a lot easier for the whales to forage. And you can think of other examples like that of easy foraging has a lot of implications for uh, everything <coughs> from looking at behavior to changes in, are they, would they lose eventually their natural ability to prey, things like that. How is this behavior transmitted? And what does this mean for mitigation? So um, one of the questions we wanted to look at is um, we're interested in how the behavior spread. A number of other people are looking at how to mitigate this. But this shows a long line boat, and there's, um, in this case, there's about four sperm whales following this boat. There's um, typically between one and seven whales that could be around the boat doing this. And the question was, have they learned this independently? <coughs> Is it vertical transmission or horizontal transmission? How, how did this arise, and how is it spreading? Um, so it, this is a graphic um, that we put together trying to understand the ontogeny at a single site. Um, the fishery in Alaska has been around since the 1960s. There was recorded associations between the boat and sperm whales as the men would clean the fish and throw the discards over, so they were essentially chumming the water. And it took sperm whales from the 1960s to about the 1970s to figure out if they not only could they eat that discard, but they could actually take it off the long line. And the first records look like they're from the late 70s. Um, however, it just went wild about the, the, the 1996 97. And since then, it seems like it's spread throughout Southeast Alaska, but it has not changed. So it's just the Southeast Alaska area. And there are um, the individuals, there's about 90 something individuals known um, depredating, and there's only a population of, say, over 100 in the area. So it looks like almost every individual is doing it. Here's uh, one of the things that happened at that same time. This shows the years along the x axis and the length of the fishing season. And it used to be a derby fishery, which meant that the men were able to go fishing, they caught um, uh, fish based on an uh, open season. And so that's quite uh, dangerous for the fishery because if they open the season and it's bad weather, uh, it can be quite dangerous for the men on the boat. And also, as the um, stock got smaller, the fishing season got smaller and smaller. So what you see here is that the fishing season was open for 12 months, and by 94, it was down to 10 days. 
What happened then um, in 95 is they went to a quota fishery. So this meant that a fishing boat got eight months of time to catch their quota, and they could go out at any time. And that's what's going on. And so what happens is the sperm whales and the fishers are in the same area at the same time, and there's almost always someone um, out during those eight months. And that um, timing is coincident with the spread of depredation. So I have a student at Cal State Fullerton who's um, trying to plot this looking at fishing records. Zach Schaffner is um, doing this for his masters. And we're trying to look at that um, time between the onset and the, um, the spread. And if you can use that period where just a few individuals recorded the behavior to focus mitigation efforts, because once you get into that exponential, it seems that it goes quickly through the population. So I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts on what this is, um, and how uh, social learning or what else it could be called is going to be. Um, we did look to see if there was any genetic pattern. This is uh, the work of another student, Sandra Moreno, who's down at the University of Baja, California. And it shows samples from individuals outside the depredation area and individuals inside the area of known depredation um, associated with boats and not associated with boats. But it doesn't mean these animals weren't at some other time associated with boats. It's just when we got the samples. And to cut to the quick here, you see the same color coding. Individuals sampled um, following long lines and individuals um, outside the area um, in green and individuals in blue inside the area of depredation but not following both. And the take home message is that there's no genetic pattern. We don't see any evidence of um, what could be look like birth or transmission. Um, and depredation doesn't seem to be associated with any particular habitat. So taken together, the rapid spread of the behavior, the geographic pattern where it's found just in one area and not in another um, in Alaska provides some preliminary support for the idea that this depredation has spread through some sort of social learning. And that's what I what sort that is, is what I'm hoping to learn from all of you. Um, one of the other interesting things here about having these uh, whales visible at the back end of a fishing boat is it's a very um, unique opportunity to look into the um, male elephant behavior. And usually the elephant male, uh, I'm sorry, male sperm whale behavior, what we know about male elephants has come from unusual opportunities to study them around uh, watering pools. This is Caitlin O'Connell Rodwell's work. And all sorts of patterns of bonds and association were found when you look, are able to look at males. And the sperm whales were thought to be completely independent on these foraging grounds. But the way that behavior is spread makes us wonder if there's things like <coughs> cohesion, mentors, dominance hierarchy, would we be able to use this platform to look at those interactions between males? It's the first time a veil has been opened on their behavior, or possibility of looking at it. And with that, um, thank you very much for your attention. I hope that that has um, shown that there's, I think, a lot of um, progress made in marine mammal work with the advent of genetics, these long-term studies, that we can really contribute to this question of behavior, evolution, and culture. How is it similar and different in the oceans? Thank you very much.